All right, welcome to the last video here in the series. Um, just to recap, we have been going through and analyzing the different stages, starting with an RTF doc that abused the equation editor exploit. We found some shell code that downloaded uh, this name.exe. This actually contained some uh, auto IT scripts. So we extracted that. We have a couple of resources here, the script itself, as well as what we found out to be another round of shell code and then the encrypted payload itself. Uh, we extracted that using um, a multi-byte XOR, and now we have stage 3.pe, uh, which is just the name that I gave that file after downloading it out of CyberChef. So if you want to recap, if you're just jumping into this video, you want to recap on any of those or actually go through the analysis, uh, you just have to back up in the playlist. Otherwise, we're going to start here and wrap up the analysis because, as you'll see, um, we're actually to the end. So uh, here we have a... We want to take a look at the file and just, again, like every artifact we extract, we start it over again with basic analysis, basic triage. And so we have um, detections through detection easy saying that this is a .NET binary. So that's a good thing. Uh, we can use dnSpy to actually decompile the code. Now, um, what I'm thinking about at this stage, .NET is commonly used as another round of downloader or dropper. So we may or may not be to the actual malware itself. There might be another stage that we have to unravel. So we have to do um, a little bit of work here in order to figure that out. One thing that can be really helpful is uh, strings, right? Strings are always important. Strings tell us a lot about the artifact that we're analyzing as well as the, you know, the state that it's in as well as, of course, what it's attempting to do. And so if we use floss on our binary here, we know it's .NET which means we're going to have predominantly wide character strings that we're interested in. Um, these strings, and let's see here. So I'm gonna scroll up. We got a lot of strings here, but uh, it's really good information. I'm gonna scroll up here and just to show you, okay, here we are in the UTF-16 LE. So like these are just static strings. There was no flossed, no decoding on our behalf. And as you're scrolling through it, I'm looking for things like this, computer name, CPU, uh, we have HTML characters, time, IP address. This looks like information that it's going to populate as a report to send back to its command and control server. Uh, now we have a user agent. We have what looks like maybe this is the XFIL uh, network comms, so FTP. There's a name. There's probably the password, maybe some geolocation. So anyways, as we're scrolling through this, there's some anti-analysis, uh, right? This looks like this is probably not heavily obfuscated. I mean, if, if the strings are still here and they're apparent, there, there still could be some obfuscation, as you'll see in a moment there is. Uh, but the fact that these strings are, are you know, basically plain, they're not protected, uh, means that this is, this is certainly the actual final stage, the malware itself. So this is a pretty good indication. We could go ahead and look at this in DNSpy and just kind of further confirm what we are dealing with here. Okay, and we will just drag and drop our suspicious binary, our malware, uh, go to the entry point, um, and certainly you'll see evidence of obfuscation here. We have some code flattening, um, which just is uh, typically with, with .NET binaries, you'll recognize it with these loops followed by a series of if statements or possibly switch statements. You'll notice that the num is the value that is driving the condition and how it flattens that is that instead of just being executed sequentially from top to bottom, uh, it's going to break up the flow of execution. And then after each iteration through this loop, uh, num, so let's see here, if num equals zero right here, this is the first iteration through the loop, num equals one, it loops back around. Now num equals one, so that'll take us right here. Now it executes this code, num is set to two, and now it iterates back around, uh, and eventually, uh, the the loop breaks, right? And so now it's hard to know. It's it's easy kind of in this example because there isn't a lot of code here, but in larger functions where this is applied, it can get a lot harder to trace. Uh, this R3P.0XT stands out. And while these variable names look to be obfuscated, uh, some of the properties and methods are not, such as enable keylogger. Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, keylogger, screen logger, enable screen logger. So it looks like um, we've, you know, we have the primary malware uh, and it's also using this code flattening technique in here as well. So we have enable keylogger. This is a property off of this class. It's a Boolean value. And as we go and investigate that class, you'll see 
Um, here's our user agent that we saw earlier. And let's just scroll down a little bit. This computer name, uh, there is our FTP address and some credential stuff and uh, other configuration, right? So this looks like the config section of our agent Tesla malware. Um, and so it, again, th there is some obfuscation here, but there isn't a whole lot. Uh, uh, we could try DE4 dot on our binary. And DE4 dot has uh, entered a, a non-maintained state. It's gotten a little bit dated here, but it still is a pretty effective and helpful tool. So anytime I'm dealing with obfuscation, I certainly would give DE4 dot a try. Once it cleans the file, that is, it removes any potential obfuscation that it can identify, you get a, a name like this, original name dash cleaned with the original extension. And uh, now we can drop that file in and go to the entry point. And in this case, it doesn't look like, uh, at least at this level, it helped to remove the code flattening. Uh, you'll notice this S method zero. So that has been renamed. So those obfuscated names, it tries to, uh, well, it does rename them and it uses this, you know, this S method zero, one, two, three, and, and so forth. So uh, in this case, it doesn't look like it helped us a ton, but it never hurts and you never know for sure until you just give it a try. So we're still going to have the most important part of the file here. The well, probably one of the more important parts of the file, the configuration. Okay, the last thing you might be wondering is how do we know what this malware actually is? And usually this couple of ways in which this can happen. Um, one is maybe you have your own signatures or access to your own signatures that can help to identify the malware family. Perhaps you recognize uh, the, the instruct, you know, something about the internal structure, the methods that it's using or calling the capabilities that it possesses, uh, the configuration file or format. Uh, those can all be things that can be very helpful. Uh, maybe you don't have that level of background or knowledge, you know, so you do a little bit of open source searching and research, um, you know, picking some of these strings and uh, just seeing what you can come up with. Uh, of course, another great tool, if you're able to search online public sources, is uh, to use something like like Triage or Virus Total um, or Malware Bazaar, uh, where the artifact came from in the first place. And um, here, let's actually look at this on the Malware Bazaar. So here we have um, the hash, and uh, just to show you how I, I generated that using PowerShell here, uh, get file hash 256 stage three, right? I don't want to use the clean version because that's going to be modified now from DE4. So use that original file that we recovered. There's our hash. Uh, you can see on triage uh, very clearly, agent Tesla, agent Tesla, and it's got a score of 10. So usually when you see those two things, uh, a, a family name and a, a score of 10, that's pretty high confidence in my world. If we look at this on the Malware Bazaar, oddly enough, I did not anticipate this, uh, but I was actually the one that I, I guess originally submitted this uh, back a little bit later this last fall. Uh, but here again, you can see very clear tagging, um, signature as well as tags from uh, the Malware Bazaar. So using open source to help when maybe your own internal resources are limited. But now we have our Agent Tesla malware, we know the configuration file, and if we had to do any more analysis, we've got a you know, not heavily obfuscated binary in order to do that. So we could figure out exactly how it works and what it's up to. So hope you enjoyed the series. If you'd like to see more, please uh, don't forget to subscribe and like and drop comments in the video, any of the videos, I'll take a look at those. Uh, I would love the feedback to have ideas as for, um, you know, another other series, another malware to look at that you would find interesting to analyze. So hope you enjoyed the series. And again, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll talk to you all in a future video. Thanks for joining me.